I'm going to be seated myself today as I continue my recovery from my multiple ailments. Uh, I like to add to those that list, and I've been adding frequently here recently. And uh, my ailment uh, that keeps me nailed down today is my back, which I haven't had trouble with for a long time. But today it has me down. Um, our trip to South Texas last week. If you sleep on a mattress that's older than you are at my age, uh, yeah, I wish it was something glamorous, you know, that uh, you get injured by, you know, a football injury, you know, playing touch football out in the yard at Thanksgiving. My, my injuries uh, at this point in my life are mattress related, so that's only so exciting, I guess. So over the last, the last couple of months, We've been talking about things related to family and uh, the, the challenges to family, the big issues families face. And uh, we are a church made up of families. And this is what we know about family. Family can be a source of some of our greatest blessings and some of our biggest challenges. Our church, and there are different kinds of churches, different personalities, structure, strategy, strategy style. Our church is a multi-generational church. It's a multi-generational church. That means that we worship together across generations. We, we celebrate our opportunity to grow together across uh, generational lines. I think there's great value in that. So if you read the Bible, you, you see there are single adults and married adults, and there are blended families, and there are single parent families, and young married, empty nesters, seniors, widows. The family portraits in the Bible reflect families in our church. So there's plenty of biblical material to look at. Here's what we know. Satan makes family a spiritual battleground in all kinds of ways. Satan knows that if he can bust up family, if he can unravel family, he can unravel church, and he can unravel society as a whole. So he's going to make it a difficult place, aside from just the regular challenges of life. We have that challenge. Throughout history, families have experienced challenges like that. We think about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the garden, and they fall to temptation. And the temptation creates conflict. They start rubbing each other the wrong way, pointing fingers at one another. We think about their children, uh, Cain and Abel, how Cain and his jealousy, angry at God, jealous of his brother, kills his brother Abel. We think about Abraham, his wife Sarah, they, they have a pretty good marriage going, they have some bumps in the road, but then they invite Hagar into their marriage, into their family, and that, uh, that creates all kinds of difficulty that continue to the present day. We see David, David's a, one, a man after God's own heart. What a great description of anybody's life. Well, that's David's description, yet... Marriage troubles, adultery, conflict between his children, conflict with his children, uh, all sorts of layers to David's family story come into play. And conditions haven't improved that much with the passing of time. And no matter how dismal the situation, this is what we have talked about in our family series, there is hope through the power of God and the redeeming grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a plan in the Bible, and the plan is a good plan. It works. shows up really early in a place like Deuteronomy 6 where you're just told, listen, here's a, here's a way to work on this. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength, and if, if you'll do that, and your kids will see you doing that, and your grandchildren will see you doing that, and then you, you talk about it, and you live it out before them, You have a chance to build something that really is going to last. It's going to be strong. It's going to be stable. And it's going to carry on uh, in ways that will overcome even the hardest of times. Now, it's easy for me to roll that out. Oh, and doesn't that sound simple? Won't that be easy? Well, no, not at all. It's a challenge to actually do it in real life, in real life circumstances. Over these weeks, we've talked about the real life challenges families face and is if those challenges weren't hard enough, Satan's attacks on family weren't hard enough, we also don't live in a vacuum. 
We're living in a real life world where there are all these other variables that come to play where, well, I still have to go to work and I'm going to deal with what's going on at work. And then there's health stuff that comes to impact what's going on in my life. And well, then there's this raising children and serving as a caregiver and a host of other things. And uh, this last week, we were out of town. I had a little more opportunity for reflection than I often do in a week and spent time in reflection, did some writing, some journaling stuff. And, and thinking about 2018, I thought, there's very little about 2018 that I'm excited about repeating ever again. The tough year for me, tough year for us. Um, and it's not over yet. I, I can see it now. I know the horizon. I'm open. This, this year is gone soon, and I can start on a new one that's going to be a whole lot better than 2018. But we, we look at the year ahead even then, and we say, boy, our nation seems to be more divided than ever. We've seen plenty of that. The voices that speak into that division seem to be louder and more shrill than ever before. We, we see uh, issues of violence, uh, still issues of race, leadership failures at all levels of society, moral failures and breakdowns, economic concerns, internationally, it's war and it's famine and it's disease and terrorism. And Then you add in those extra little gifts we've had across the country this year of just terrible storms and floods, the wildfires that cause so much destruction. And it's a scary world out there. It's The phrasing we use a lot in our church, if you're new to our church, you haven't heard this maybe, it's a broken world. Uh, this is the world, and the world is broken, and we feel it. A and we see it. We feel it in us. We feel it around us. And sometimes we can be going, everything just going big guns, and all's great for me and mine. And the broken world falls on me, or it runs into me. Uh, no invitation, nothing I have done. It just We live in a broken world, and sometimes it's going to work that way. And hope can be hard to find in a broken world. And so where do we turn? Uh, I have a picture for you. Let's see your picture. If you're going to visit Israel, you need to visit the Israel Museum. And this is one part of the Israel Museum. This is the shrine of the book. And it's a really cool place. Uh, some of you have traveled with me, been to Israel a couple of times with groups from our church, and when when and, and some of you have been other other places from, with other groups, and that that Israel museum, I could spend a very long time there. That people have to drag me out, kicking and screaming, to leave that place. Most museums, I really don't care that much about. I can I can walk through quickly. I do not have to read every plaque uh, on every display. But you drop me into the museum there in Israel, and there's just a whole lot to see. And the great part about it is how archaeology has affirmed and affirmed the authority of Scripture, the reliability of the story, uh, never disputed it, always affirmed it, always strengthened it, and encouraged it. And that's the amazing part of biblical archaeology and study of biblical truth is the stuff you find. And I just love celebrating that, seeing these things. A part of the complex that is the museum there in Israel, in Jerusalem, the Israel Museum, is the shrine of the book. And the architecture is partly kind of crazy in this place because we're seeing the inside. The outside uh, shows this too, but you see there's, it goes round and round in the, the picture there. That's because it's made like a clay pot, like the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in, because the shrine of the book is dedicated to celebrating the discovery in 1947 of the Dead Sea Scrolls, particularly those first seven scrolls that they found. So the architecture is, this is a big clay pot. And what you see in the middle there, that big round thing with a handle on it, it's like the spindle that one of these scrolls would be wrapped around. And what is on runs around that display case that's lit up in the yellow look there, is an ex exact replica of the Isaiah scroll, the great Isaiah scroll. Now, the original has been on display, and the other originals are 
sometimes on display. And it's a big deal because most of the time they're stuck underneath this place in this climate-controlled, light-controlled environment where they can really be protected. And you can find all these things. Now they have the, the visuals of the originals online, and you can look at them there. But this is on display, the Isaiah scroll, 66 books. The, same, it's a, the reason it's a big deal, it's a complete scroll of all 66, what is our 66 chapters, of the book of Isaiah. It's uh, found in 1947, 54 columns, 66 chapters, the Hebrew version of the biblical book of Isaiah. It dates, the Isaiah scroll dates to 125 B.C. Uh, that makes it the, about the oldest of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found. And in a community, they're close to the Dead Sea, in an ancient community called Qumran. And... Uh, Here's, what's, here's the big deal with the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were a big deal because everybody always likes to say, well, the Bible's been changed over all these years. It's always, it, it, it's been adjusted and edited, and uh, it's not the same anymore as it was back then. And so the Dead Sea Scrolls, like this Isaiah scroll, it was a thousand years older than any manuscript that we had. A thousand years older than any manu Hebrew manuscript of Isaiah that we had. There are other scrolls representing uh, most of the other books of the Old Testament. This is a thousand years older, and it was the same. That those scribes were so faithful to, to record one letter at a time. You couldn't do a word at a time. You'd do a letter. Letter at a time. And they carefully transmitted the faithful text of the scriptures. And everything in the Dead Sea Scrolls is all Old Testament. Old Testament stuff. No, no New Testament stuff in that. But it is such a, an encouragement and affirmation. That's why Dead Sea Scrolls are a big deal. Now, among the scrolls found at Qumran, there are 20 additional copies of large portions of the book of Isaiah. There are also six commentaries found at Qumran on the book of Isaiah. Uh, another book just quotes it extensively. Uh, another one of the scrolls found in one of these pots that was hidden in a cave uh, in the area around Qumran. Also worth noting, the book of Isaiah is quoted 85 times in the New Testament. 85 times. That makes Isaiah a, just uh, an off-the-charts big deal. And it was a big deal to these guys living at Qumran. Uh, and here's, here's, uh, here's their deal. So why attention to this book? Well, it was powerful to them, powerful for our times, because Isaiah speaks to dark times, hard times, and it shines this incredible light of hope into the darkness. And, and, and this is hope. When we think about hope. We think about wishful thinking. This is not hope that's, well, I hope it works out, kind of wishful thinking. This is hope that is assurance hope that is settled, hope that is confident because of a holy God in all of His glory and power, and He has promised us, sent to us a Savior. So the people at Qumran are known as Essenes, E-S-S-E-N-E-S. -E -S -E -S. And here's, here's who they were. They were a group of people that they were in Jerusalem, and they just said, you know... They're doing a lot of religious stuff here, but there's not a whole lot that's really spiritual about what they're doing. There's so much, so much compromise, so much corruption. They're, they're really so far from God and what they're doing at the temple. We don't want to be a part of it anymore. And so they had abandoned Jerusalem. They've gone out here into the wilderness, and they said, you know what it should look like? The holy life, the dedicated life, the committed life to God, it ought to look like what Isaiah talked about. And they built a lot of how they did life at Qumran. Uh, around the book of Isaiah. And that's why it's elevated to such a high level of attention at uh, Qumran, where the, the community that produced we, what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. They saw worldliness in Jerusalem. They saw worldliness in the temple. And they said, this just should not be. Now, the Essenes were not a new group by the time Jesus comes around. They had been in existence for about 100 years. But, there was a very small community out at Qumran, and then Herod the Great shows up. 
Well, Herod the Great, he rebuilds the temple in Jerusalem. He brings it up to, boy, this is a glorious, incredible structure again, uh, pretty close to what Solomon had produced uh, hundreds of years earlier that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. So now he's, he put it back together. So Herod does that, but Herod does it for purely political reasons. He's not a spiritual guy at all. He's a real jerk in all kinds of ways. You remember, it's Herod the Great that he's going to try to kill baby Jesus when the wise men come and say, you know, where is he? He's born king of the Jews. We've come to worship him. And uh, Herod goes after him. Well, Herod offended more people, and so some more people shifted to Qumran. There's got to be something that's more true to God's word and true to God's character than what we're doing out here in, in Jerusalem. And then Herod the Great's sons come along. Well, they're the biggest knuckleheads ever. Far from God in every imaginable way. And then you have the Roman governors who replace some of them, and they're certainly far from God. They're playing a religious game and a whole lot of politics, and they just want nothing to do with this. So the Qumran community grew larger during Jesus' time, uh, most certainly. And when... You get to about two-thirds of the way through the first century, the Jewish people, they rise up against the Romans. Well, that, that just didn't go well at all. And the Romans uh, start taking things apart. They just said, okay, these people have been rebelling for a long time. They've been a thorn in our side for a long time. Now rebellion, and the Romans, they're going to wreck them. They destroy that temple. They, they, well, the Essenes out at Qumran, they know the Romans are coming. They're in an isolated place, close to the Dead Sea. And so what they do is they know they're going to destroy everything we've got. And they took these precious scrolls that they've been transmitting uh, and reproducing. They put them in clay pots and they hid them in the caves that dot the, the hillsides up above the Dead Sea. And because of the climate's so very dry, these scrolls survive until 1947 and then the years after when they keep finding more of them and more of them. They, they found some just a few years ago in yet another cave that the entrance was blocked off. And they found more uh, scrolls produced by these folks. Now, the book of Isaiah written 8th century B.C. is a collection of stories, a collection of prophecies, of biblical teachings, uh, historical references. But the common theme as you read through Isaiah is salvation that the Lord saves. He rescues, he delivers, and he is holy. Isaiah ministered as a prophet of God through that 8th century in a time of great turbulence. There's international conflict. There's a threat of international conflict. All that's familiar territory to Isaiah. Dishonesty, lack of integrity in the nation's leadership, in the nation's spiritual leadership and political leadership was common. He, he addresses a lot of business practices. They were dishonest. They were manipulative, especially taking, taking advantage of, of the poor. You find uh, him speaking to the people. This is a good uh, note for uh, your Christmas shopping. They were overwhelmingly materialistic. They were all about their stuff. And Isaiah challenges them hard on those things. The nation as a whole had turned from God, and they were looking for meaning and purpose in everything except, except God. People are still going through life, but without real, uh, real purpose and without much hope. The kingdom of Assyria, and there's the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent, it runs from Egypt and it runs up through Israel and it loops around. It comes down the Tigris-Euphrates River uh, chain. And so that's the Fertile Crescent. Assyria was dominating that whole region and everybody was watching Babylon. Because Babylon was going to be taken that from the Assyrians. Israel was weak and vulnerable in the middle of all of that. And the question becomes for God's people, so what's going to become of all these promises of God? God has said, I'm going to do all this great stuff. I'm going to be there for this nation of Israel. But what's going to happen? How's this going to play out? Where is this thing going to land? And it doesn't look good. Now, why did the Essenes of Qumran, near the Dead Sea, embraced the book of Isaiah so broadly because it spoke to their time, just like it spoke to Isaiah's unstable time, just like it speaks to our unstable time. We all need 
this infusion, a regular dousing of hope in a world that is unraveling so many different levels. So we're going to talk about hope today. We have several references because I'm going to, in January, I'll start with a brand new Bible and my highlighter, and I'm going to mark up uh, another Bible and read through it in the course of a year. It's a goal I set a long time ago. I'll do it at least once a year. I'm going to read through the whole Bible. So I'm going to start, and I'm going to start the same place I start every January. I start in the book of Isaiah. It's my favorite book in the Old Testament. It covers so much territory. It connects everything Old Testament with what's coming in the New Testament so well. It's just a good place for me to start. So, I'm going to share my favorite verse from Isaiah because I'm sitting up here in this chair so I can. So here we go. Here's the first thing. We talk about hope from the book of Isaiah. How about this hope in the calling of God? Isaiah 6. But I preached my first sermon from this passage. I just sense that overwhelming sense of calling to ministry, having prepared for everything else except that. Hadn't never had considered it before. To God spoke to me in a desperate time of prayer in my own life, seeking the peace of God in my heart for what He wanted me to do with my life, and and it was just a few weeks later that I had the opportunity to preach my first sermon at the uh, a little church in Ra- a mission church in Raisin, Texas. There's a there was an abandoned uh, bar. In an abandoned dance hall, that was all that was left in Raisin, Texas. I preached in the abandoned bar from behind the bar. That was my first sermon. Any of you ever vacationed in Raisin, Texas? Ruth Ann, do you know where Raisin is? <laughs> well, you know, it's about halfway between Victoria and Goliad. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Yeah, between Victoria and Goliad. Uh, you've heard of Goliad? Remember Goliad, remember the Alamo, if you have any Texas history, it's right, thank you, it's right close to uh, Coletta Creek. You know, because Coletta Creek, uh, now, now we're, okay, Texas history, it's on. Uh, so Colonel Fannin, who was supposed to uh, relieve the folks at the Alamo, well, he got pinned down by Santa Ana's army, and they're fighting all through the Coletta Creek uh, river, uh, uh, creek bed. And uh, end up made it back to Goliad, where uh, they were massacred by Santa Ana. Yeah, at least you had a happy story for Thanksgiving, right? Okay. Hope in the calling of God, and I, and this passage is the calling of Isaiah. And I heard a voice of the Lord saying, "Whom shall I send, and who will go for us?" Then I said, "This is Isaiah talking." Then I said, "Here am I. Send me. You need somebody. I am your guy." Says Isaiah. So here's Isaiah. He's a young guy, well-trained. We believe a part of the royal family. He is ambitious, secure in the land of Israel. Everything is good and up to the right for Isaiah. Everything's great because King Uzziah has been king for decades now. He's brought prosperity and peace and, and, and all kinds of good things to the land of Israel. But chapter 6 begins with that phrase, in the year that King Uzziah died. And everything became insecure and scary and unstable when King Uzziah died because there wasn't anybody to replace him who was going to be like him. And they could see the rumblings of international geopolitical stuff going on out there. And they knew, this is, we need a strong leader and we do not have one. Uh, I don't know if many of you have had this experience where everything is settled and secure and everything is good in life. And then there comes a day. And all of a sudden, it's one phone call. It's one doctor visit. And all of a sudden, everything that was nailed down and rolling along, everything is good until one day it is not good anymore. And hope seems hard to come by. That's the calling of Isaiah. And Isaiah said, for such a time as this, uh, I'm called out. I love the calling story of Moses. Um, Moses, he, remember, he's born into a slave family. He ends up being raised in the home of the Egyptian Pharaoh. He receives every benefit of the educational background and training of Egypt. And he sees, these are my people, these Hebrew people. 
And he tries to manipulate some things himself, but it doesn't work out. And he ends up, he ends up having to run for his life, and he ends up on the backside of the wilderness for the next 40 years of his life. Okay, now I'm a shepherd working for my father-in-law. This isn't really what I saw my life becoming, and everything seems pretty dark for Moses. Then he sees that burning bush one day. He goes over, and the voice of God speaks to him. And he has this, Moses still has that holy discontent. I got a burden for my people, Israel, and slavery back in Egypt. And then God says, I am going to free my people from slavery in Egypt. And what does Moses say? This is awesome. Pulls out his phone. Hashtag blessed. God's going to deliver the people. And then he says, I can't wait to see how God does this. God does miraculous things. How's God going to deliver them? And God says, I'm sending you to deliver them. Well, that's the worst news Moses ever had. Then he starts, then he starts whoa, let's back this train up. Uh, you see, I'm not a very good speaker. I'm really not your guy. They don't like me so much back there, but best I can remember. And there's got to be somebody better than me. But when he stepped into the calling of God, not only did God use him to deliver, the greatest redemptive event in the Old Testament takes place, the exodus out of Egypt. But God does some things in Moses that just transform him into a whole new guy and give him this whole new passion and purpose. And he becomes this hero of the Old Testament in all kinds of ways because of the calling of God. In 1 Kings 20, there's a story about Ahab. And Ahab is, is a jerk. He does a lot of bad stuff. But God can, still, God can use a nut like Ahab too. At one point, the Syrian army, they're coming with an overwhelming force Ahab, he didn't know what he's going to do. And God sends a nameless prophet. He's not even named, but a prophet comes and says, Ahab, don't be afraid. Because you, you, we're going to defeat this enemy arm. Ben-Hadad's got nothing on you. We're going to wipe him out, and you're going to have a great victory. And Ahab, Ahab's saying, I'm like Moses, oh, that's great news. I love that. And he asked the question in the Bible, so who's going to lead the battle? And the word of the Lord comes, well, Ahab, you are. Oh, man, didn't see that one coming. But God's able to use even a, a nut like Ahab to accomplish this great eternal purpose and, and, to, and to deliver the people. And God does a few good things even in a hard heart like, uh, like old Ahab. God can deliver you out of any circumstance. I mean, God can just make that happen. It's true for true for. Moses, true for Isaiah, true for a guy like Ahab. He can, he can deliver. And all on his own. But often in the Bible, he wants to work through people. Because God doesn't just want to accomplish the victory. He wants to grow some people to love him and know him and serve him beyond the moment. He wants to grow them too. So he invites us into his great eternal plan. And listen, when you feel hopelessness and helplessness, and some of you do today, you know, call on God. Don't, 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 don't make him your last resort. Like, well, I've tried everything else. I guess I better pray now. But go to him first. But when you, when you go to him, maybe he will do it in a moment, in a miraculous lightning from heaven kind of way. But most of the time, he wants to... He wants to take you in the broken you feel and the fear you feel. And he wants, to, he wants to work through you. So he builds things into your character that help you to be a person of greater faith, of greater use and service in the future. He wants to do some things in you that are going to touch eternity because he cares about your eternal soul more, more than about just your temporary circumstances. He wants to give you hope, but he may want to use you to bring hope to somebody else. And if you'll take your eyes off of what's around you, and start doing God's stuff, sometimes it lifts you above the fray. And you start seeing the light that is the hope of our Savior. A mission of hope. Hope in a miraculous sign. This from uh, Isaiah 7. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is Isaiah speaking to King Ahaz. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, 
King Ahaz in that context was surrounded, a couple of enemy armies bearing down on him. He was outgunned. And he, he goes out in Jerusalem, and the description that the Bible gives us of where he was, he's at a high spot where he can see his fortifications. He is surveying, can I hold out? Can I do this myself? And most things with Ahaz, he's trying to do himself. He wants to do it with, without God. He's not too worried about God being a part of things. He makes so many bad choices in the course of being king there in Jerusalem. And so God sends Isaiah to him at that spot with this message. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. You should call his name Emmanuel. Out of all the signs God could have given him, he probably wished for a lot more than that. A baby is going to be born. Uh, in his context, you see that woman? Young woman, a virgin. She's not even married to anybody. She's going to have... She's going to have a husband. She's going to have a baby. Before that baby's old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, Isaiah tells him. These two enemy armies that are such a big threat to you today, they won't even exist anymore. They'll be, they'll be wiped off the map. Everything's going to be okay. Now, Matthew, he gets the fulfillment of this thing in the biggest and boldest of ways. Because Matthew grabs that verse from Isaiah 7, and he takes it all the way to the story of Jesus. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us is what Emmanuel means. God with us. See, that Christmas story is about more than, well, now I have a reason to decorate the house. It's a lot bigger than that. It's a lot bolder than that. It's a message of hope into a broken world and our broken lives. A Savior has come. He is for you. He is with you. He loves you. Hope in God's person, just who God is. And this from Isaiah 9, this familiar territory for those of you who have heard Christmas uh, sermons before. This is a great description of the character of our Lord. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Most of us have probably received poor counsel sometime in our life, right? A lot of us, you live very long, you have given some bad advice. I've given bad advice too. That is what you ought to do. Man, I wish I could pull that one back. Oh my. But here, in this passage, we need a wonderful counselor. We don't need a quick fix. We, we need help figuring out what to do and how to do it. And, and our Lord, for whatever you face today, whatever big decision is hanging for you, the choice that, you know, this is either going to go really bad or really well, we need a wonderful counselor. That's the nature of our Lord. He's a mighty God. Uh, one uh, Bible scholar writing about this, that mighty God concept, this is how he said it. I just want to read this to you. He is the mighty God. He is God, and because He is God, He can forgive sin, defeat Satan, liberate people from the power of evil, redeem them, answer their prayers, restore their broken souls, and reign over a rebuilt life, bringing order to chaos. He is a mighty God. We're safe and secure in the loving arms of an everlasting Heavenly Father. No matter how insecure the world is, no matter how broken the world is, no matter how far from God it is, your world has hope because we have an everlasting God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going anywhere. And then He's a Prince of Peace because He reigns in our heart. And there can be turmoil all around us, confusion, uh, devastation, disaster. And he raises above all those things, and he brings peace even in the storm. And he still calms storms too. We have hope in a gracious Savior. Well, Isaiah points to Jesus so clearly and so often. Isaiah 53 is a great Christological passage, a passage about the Christ. And he says, remember, eight centuries before Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
And we find Jesus on display in such dramatic ways in this book of Isaiah. Where does your hope come from? Your hope comes from Jesus, who left the glory of heaven, came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross to pay for all of our sins, was raised gloriously on the third day from the dead, walked around for 40 days and interacted with his disciples so that several hundred people gave personal witness to the risen Savior, ascended back into heaven, intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father, is coming again for us on the clouds of glory. This is our Savior. You need hope today? Man, I need hope today. The giver of all hope loves you, and his name is Jesus. And then hope in a caring Lord. Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Are you hurting today? This, this was the, the text Jesus used for his sermon when he'd already started his public ministry. He'd touched base several little villages, but then he comes back to his hometown of Nazareth. He goes to the synagogue. They've been hearing about the miracles. They've been hearing about the teaching, and they want to hear what he has to say. And he shared, this is what Jesus, he takes Isaiah, and he shares that passage. And he takes the scroll and puts it aside, and this is my, uh, my translation of the original Hebrew. He says, you hear all that? That's me. I'm that guy. He says, they wanted to kill him for it. Blasphemy! But that is who Jesus is. The much longed for prophesied Messiah. Everybody in Nazareth in the synagogue that day knew this is about the Messiah. And Jesus claimed it for himself. He has good news for the poor. And that literally means the humble, the lowly, the needy, the afflicted, the people who are outcast, the people who are forgotten, the people who are last in society, uh, the least in society, the people who realize, I need saving. I can't do this myself. I can't accomplish things on my own. I need a God to do this for me. And until you get to there, you can't be saved. He comes for those who know they're sick, not for those who think they are well. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He has good news for those who realize they desperately need a Savior. Hey, I don't know what life has been like for all of you today, or what today is like. And perhaps it has been so hard, you just wonder what the purpose of it all is. And it could be recent tragedy, recent trial. It, you just start feeling so heavy and so weary and so worn It's hard to imagine any way out, any way up. And the noise in your head of your self-talk, of thinking about all the things that are wrong and all the things that need to be made right, and everything that's wrong around you and in you, that voice is so loud, it can be hard to hear the still, small voice of our Lord who said, Come to me, all of you who are weary, carry heavy burdens. I'll give you rest. He stands ready to restore what has been taken away. He can bring beauty from ashes. He sets us free from the things that bind, the slavery to sin. He longs to heal brokenness, and he brings hope. My favorite set of verses in Isaiah come in chapter 64. And... Uh, that's the way I want to land this today. The prophet is, is, is throwing out some big stuff there in the first verse of Isaiah 64. And he says, I love this part. He's crying out to the Lord in desperation. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. God, I'm just praying you just tear it open and you'd just come down to us. And that's the story of Jesus. God rended the heavens and came down. 
Oh, that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries and the nations might tremble at your presence. And that next sentence, I love it. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down. Uh, one translation says, you just did crazy things we didn't expect. Man, God does it that way sometimes. He just breaks through in a way that I never saw that coming. God did it in a way I never would have imagined because that's who God is. The mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God beside you who acts for those who wait for him. When you wait upon the Lord in obedience and faith, there's a light that starts to shine that brings hope to the darkest things in our lives. For some of you, maybe the most familiar verse in all of Isaiah is Isaiah 40, verse 31. They that wait for the Lord will renew their strength. Oh, wait for the Lord. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Wait upon the Lord. The hope declared in Isaiah is our hope. and It's not a hope in, in me. It's not a hope in my ability. It's not a hope in our religious activity. It's not a hope that's based on if we can just elect the right person to office, everything's going to be grand. It's a hope in the Savior who has come. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. He has come. Every day, let's see if we can encounter new stories of people, all ages, all stages of life, wounded, weary. And maybe you're one of those people today. Some of you walk down long, hard paths. Some of you are in the trenches of the battle just now. And whether you're beyond the struggle or you're in it and you're just exhausted, to each of you, different stories, different seasons of life when things uh, are more likely to come our way, I want to offer a word of hope today. And I want to, I want to acknowledge right off, words are not going to fix it for you just now. I can say all of this, and it, well, man, I'm going to walk out of here, and I don't have to worry about that anymore. Everything's fixed. Everything's tied up with a bow, and I'll put it under the tree, and it's awesome. But I hope, I pray, that out of all of this from Isaiah, the one thing that we would all do is we'd say, okay, instead of looking at how bad it is, how I wish it was different, how I wish I could change things, and we just turn our gaze upward and say, whatever my hope is going to be, it's not going to be anything on the horizontal level. It's going to be on the vertical. And I'm going to have to put all my trust in the Lord. Because He is the only source of lasting, eternal, get me out of the mess I'm in, redeem my sinful soul, hope. I, I don't remember where I found this. But it's in my prayer notebook, and I keep it handy, and I review it periodically. I want to share it with you. Because of Christ's work on the cross, you can rest in the promise, He will always be enough. And then the author says, when you're restless and discouraged, Jesus really is enough. When you're tired and weary, Jesus is enough. When you're overwhelmed and afraid, Jesus is enough. When you're grieving and hurting, Jesus really is enough. When you're angry and frustrated, Jesus is enough. When you're ashamed and remorseful, Jesus is enough. When you're doubtful and cynical, Jesus is enough. When you're lonely and depressed, Jesus is enough. When your troubles consume you, when your emotions control you, when you question your worth and your purpose in life, Jesus is going to be enough. I want you to know, my friends, my church family, know that Jesus is for you. He does sit at the right hand of the Father. He it, offering intercession for you today. So tell him what's on your heart. And thank him for lavishing his grace upon you. Salvation, grace that leads to forgiveness of sin, relationship to God, eternal life in heaven. Grace that sustains you when it's hard. He loves you. He is your only hope for life and for eternity. 
And what I want to encourage you to do in this day between Thanksgiving and beginning of the Christmas run with December is to look to Him. Turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory. Grace. Everything here gets small when God gets big. Let's look to Him.